Welcome to another lecture of biomaterials. Today I have an outline for what we're going to talk about in today's lecture, and today's lecture is going to center around material properties. And in particular, materials mechanical properties. So why might we care about mechanical properties? Well, in the previous lecture, we talked about stress and strain. And we said, hey, there are, you know, we, there we have some definitions of stress, you know, normal stress, true, you know, true stress versus engineering stress, and strain, true strain versus engineering strain. Um, but we really didn't describe the relationships between the two, other than that we anticipate that the more stress that something is under, the more strain it experiences. Today, we're going to make those connections between stress and strain. So the connections um, between stress and strain are governed by materials mechanical properties. And that if we know these mechanical properties, then uh, with knowledge of what stress the material might be under, we could predict its strain, or vice versa, with knowledge about what strain it's experiencing, then we could predict its stress. And the predictions between stress and strain give us, um, you know, give us a basis of engineers for predicting, you know, is something going to break too much, or is it going to deform too much under various, uh, various conditions that we place it. So, how are we going to break down all these mechanical properties? Well, there are actually like a ton of mechanical properties that we might be concerned about um, as engineers. So uh, first, we're going to sort of orient ourselves with the stress-strain curve. And I'm just going to give an example stress-strain curve just so you can sort of see for one particular material. Then I'm going to briefly discuss how, uh, how it's obtained. Right, how my, you know, these stress, like, it's not like the clouds open up and Professor Landon's face pokes through and says, this is the stress strain curve for titanium, and then the clouds close up back up, right? That data came from somewhere. So how might we actually obtain a stress strain curve experimentally? Uh, then we're just going to go through a whole slew of mechanical properties that we might care about. So the first we're going to talk about is the Young's modulus. which has another name, the modulus of elasticity. Which has another name, it's elastic modulus. Which has another name, it's stiffness. And, uh, and just, to get, just a heads up, we're going to need to be very precise with a lot of language that we use. Um, in this class. So, you know, words that you might have uh, or, or your non-engineering colleagues might have historically kind of swapped out strength and stiffness and toughness um, and resilience and things like that, um, you know, all of those sort of qualitatively might strike a similar feeling um, to non-engineers. But as engineers, these all have precise, uh, precise definitions and they, and they mean quite different things in terms of how they parameterize the stress-strain relationship. Well, of course, um, hash out these precise definitions today. Uh, the next thing we'll talk about very briefly is the shear modulus. Then we'll talk about Poisson's ratio. Which doesn't actually come from the stress strain curve, but it's kind of related to it, so I thought I would talk about it. Uh, then we'll talk about um, the yield strength. Which has another name, the, the, um, which is sort of coincidental with the linear elastic limit. Or the proportional limit. And it turns out somewhat out of coincidence that these that these three things sort of all happen at the same point on the stress strain curve. We're also going to talk about the ultimate strength. And the fracture strength. And the elongation at break.
We'll also talk about toughness and resilience. And when we talk about toughness, we'll actually, uh, we'll sort of talk about ductile versus brittle materials. And how they, how those two types of materials might differ in their toughness and what their stress strain curves might look like. So we got a lot, we got a lot of stuff to cover. So let's start talking about the stress strain curve. So we anticipate that when we are placing a material under stress, the more stress we place it under, the more strain it undergoes. And when we think about a stress strain curve, we're essentially just plotting those two against one another. And different materials have different stress strain curves. And the typical convention for plotting stress strain curves is to plot stress on the y-axis and to plot strain on the x-axis. And by, you know, by plotting stress versus strain, rather than, for example, like, you know, force versus delta L or something like that, we've now made this, made this relationship sort of invariant to the exact type uh, chunk of material that we looked at, right? So for example, if I had a chunk of material that looked like this versus a chunk of material that looked like this, as long as these two things were made of the same material, you know, one the thicker material might require more force than the smaller material to deform, but both of these materials, as long as they're made, for example, from the same type of plastic or the same type of metal or the same type of tissue, both of these will have the same stress strain curve. So when we think about stress strain curves, we plot stress versus strain. And you can imagine that when I have uh, when I have a material and I'm placing, uh, and I don't, you know, I haven't placed any strain on it at all, then, you know, uh, it's, it's not experiencing a state of stress at all. Then you can imagine as I start to take this material and stretch it out a little bit, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, imposing more strain on this material, and the more strain I, I impose on it, the more stress it undergoes, right? It's just like, you know, you have a spring or a rubber band or something like that, you know, it takes just a little bit of force to stretch it a little bit, but if you stretch it a lot, it takes a lot more force. And stress and strain are proportional to one another for a little while. So this, these, these two things start out proportional to one another. But after a little while, um, it, it starts to flatten out a little bit. Again, not all, mater not all materials have, have stress-strain curves that look exactly like the one that I'm sketching here, but enough materials do that it's it's worth uh, you know it's worth sort of characterizing many materials this way so they remain proportional to one another for a little while and then uh, and then you know the stress starts to kind of level off a little bit um, as the strain as the strain strain continues to increase uh, and then eventually actually that stress goes back down and then right here and if you were to think about what happens right here at this sort of last moment of strain this is basically where the material actually fractures into two separate pieces. So if we take out our Play-Doh, um, it turns out, you know, for Play-Doh, this, this part of the curve barely exists at all. Um, you know, I'm stretching, I'm stretching, I'm stretching. And when the, when the two pieces of Play-Doh Play broke apart, that's, you know, that's where I'm at for this point right here. So, um, so, so there we are. So, so here, you know, here's this stress strain, uh, stress strain curve. And if I think about um, strain, strain basically has uh, units of no, it's, it's unitsless, right? Remember it was like a delta L over an L, so it's unitless, sometimes expressed as a percent. And stress would typically have uh, would typically have units of force uh, force over uh, area. So, for example, um, it might have units of pascals, 
if we were in SI. And this, this particular curve right here, um, if, we, if we sort of actually put, put real, you know, real actual numbers on the X and Y um, axes, I kind of dis distorted the curve just a little bit, but um, if we imagine, uh, you know, diff different materials have different stress strain curves, right? Play-Doh is going to be a whole lot different than plastic, which is going to be a whole lot different than metal. You know, all of these have different stress strain curves. Um, one, one stress strain curve we could do, for example, one particular titanium alloy. Has, has a stress strain curve that looks like this, and we can put some particular numbers to all of these axes. Let's say 0 0.01 or one, you know, one percent right here is basically where it starts to deviate from linear. Um, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, 0 0.15, something like that. And on the y-axis, let's say like 0.5. 1.0 and the units here are not pascals right a pascal is actually something pretty tiny um, but this is gigapascals which equals 10 to the sixth pascals so so for for particular titanium alloys when you stretch it out about if you increase its length by just a percent um, you need to put that material under a gigapascal it's 1.0 times 10 to the sixth pascals in order to stretch it out that much. So quite a, quite a bit of stress for that titanium, uh, titanium alloy. So this is, this is basically um, what, uh, what a stress strain curve might look like. Um, not all stress strain curves look like this, but for titanium, that's what it looks like. And lots of, lots of uh, metals and many plastics. So that's what a stress strain curve is. Plotting, you know, you take you take some chunk of material, you stretch it out, you measure you you measure how much stress and how much strain it did to do that, and you essentially plot all of that data. And there's this sort of linear region, and then it kind of deviates from linearity um, af after that point there. So how you know how are these obtained? Um, well, um, you basically you you have some specimen, you know some some chunk of material right maybe it's a chunk of tissue that you took out of some organism maybe it's you know a new type of plastic or a new type of uh, metal alloy that you've created regardless you form it into some particular shape and then there's basically a special machine and that machine essentially has two jaws two clamps and you clamp down on one end and you clamp down on the other end and one, uh, one or both of these jaws are basically equipped to um, high-force linear motors that can essentially pull, pull, the, uh, pull the material at some specified speed and measure very precisely how much it's pulled when it's doing that. Um, and then uh, one of the jaws of that materials testing machine has a force sensor that essentially is measuring how much force is transmitted from the jaw through through the material to the other jaw, so you know there's like a little force sensor kind of in between, essentially, the jaw and the material itself, or one part of the jaw and another part of the jaw that basically is measuring how much force the jaw is applying to the material. So by basically knowing, so the material, so the tester measures force. Um, through through the jaw, it also measures displacement, i.e., delta L. Right, remember the change the change in length for the material. Right, so we can measure force. Right, F measure uh, and it measures the displacement, and then. If we know the cross-sectional area, right? If we, you know, if we know, you know, how much area that cross-section of that specimen had, for example, by taking a pair of calipers and measuring its diameter, if it's, you know, a sphere or its side length, if it's a, a rectangle or something like that, um, we could know its cross-sectional area beforehand. For example, by measuring with calipers. 
right? Those those little those little devices that sort of you know give a readout of what the distance between the jaws is. And we also know the initial the initial length, you know, which could also be measured with calipers or or from how it's manufactured or just from the initial displacement between the jaws. Basically, if we know all of these things, you know, this gives us um, you know, the force divided by the cross-sectional area would give us stress. The displacement divided by its initial displacement would give us strain. And beca basically, because while while the materials while the material t tester is stretching out the material, it would be very challenging to sort of like keep running up with a pair of calipers to measure its air its cross-sectional area continuously. Most of these stress-strain curves that you'll see in um, in the literature and you know from um, you know from suppliers or material testing websites, these are almost always given in terms of engineering stress and engineering strain. Basically, because it's really cumbersome to try to measure that cross-sectional area continuously as it's changing, and to uh, and it's pretty straightforward to measure its initial length and you know um, so because it's it, it's straightforward experimentally to measure these values initially. Um, it's easier to plot your stress and strain using their engineering engineering values. Um, so that's basically how um, how these things are obtained. And you know, you can get very fancy materials testers. You can get relatively cheap ones. We have one um, in our uh, in our um, undergrad education lab right here on campus. All right, so that's how that's how these are obtained. Now let's start looking at some characteristics of the stress strain curve here. And in particular, we'll look at sort of this first one, the Young's modulus, also known as modulus of elasticity. So if we look at this, this material right here, we might notice that, hey, if there's this sort of linear region, right, you know, this, this first part of this curve for many, many, many materials is linear, we could characterize this by a slope. And this slope is given a special name. Spoiler alert, it's given the name of the Young's modulus. Or the modulus of elasticity. Or the elastic modulus. Or the stiffness. So you can you can use all four of the any four of these terms interchangeably to describe the slope of the linear region, the slope of the linear region, this initial linear region of the stress strain curve, and oftentimes it's you oftentimes it's given a variable capital E. So capital E is is usually is usually um, what we use the letter we use to describe the slope of this here. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. If you were to consider this line, what would be the equation? Of that line. So pause and ponder. Well, hopefully we've had a chance to think about it, right? We could sort of imagine, you know, the equation of a line is y equals mx plus b. Only instead of y, we would use our we would have our engineering stress, and instead of m, we have this slope Young's modulus e, and instead of x, we have engineering strain. And there's no y-intercept because at a value out of zero engineering strain, the material should be under zero stress. So it's essentially y equals mx plus 0, or just this relationship that we have here. So that's, so that's what we can use here. So as long as we have a linear elastic material, um, and as long as we keep its strain and stress sort of below this point, you know, less than this point here where it starts to deviate, um, we can use this equation here. So this is basically valid when linear elastic And less than uh, less than what's uh, less than sort of this this point here, which spoiler alert is going to be the yield. 
stress. So we can relate these two. And, you know, what better relationship than a linear one? So that's, that's, that's all these things uh, right here. Now, let's talk about the shear modulus. Well, the shear modulus is, is sort of related to Young's modulus, right? If you remember, um, you know, this essentially describes normal strains, right? This was a normal stress. Stress and a normal strain. If you remember, there was also shear stress and shear strain. So shear stress, we oftentimes use the, the Greek letter tau for shear stress. And if you remember, uh, and you know, what, what does shear stress look like? Shear stress is, remember, if we look at something from the side and we apply, and we apply some force you know some forces that look like we look that look like this you know then that material ends up sort of deforming into a kind of parallelogram like shape and you can characterize you know the the amount of deformation that the, this material has undergone in a sort of sheer way by sort of imagining this angle here you could call it gamma um, so shear stress is basically proportional to shear strain in the same way that normal stress is proportional to normal strain. For normal stress and normal strain, the proportionality constant is the Young's modulus. For shear stress and shear strain, the proportionality constant is, well, you guessed, it's called the shear modulus. And that would be measured not with a not with a sort of tensile tester like this, but rather with some sort of device that can apply shear stresses and try to try to measure things that way. So, um, so just to give you a heads up, if you see shear modulus, it's it's describing sort of this relationship. And it turns out that for a lot of materials, these two are basically linked to one another. They're proportional to one another. So for for materials that have a higher Young's modulus, they almost always have higher shear modulus as well. So now let's talk about Poisson's ratio. And it turns out that Poisson's ratio is not actually from, uh, not it's not actually derived from this stress strain curve, but it's a material property that's worth talking about, worth taking a little bit of a sidetrack about. So let's look at Poisson's ratio. So if you remember, usually when we have some material, let's say a chunk of material that looks like this, and we apply some force to it, when you do forces in tension, if we apply tension to it, it stretches out, and for some materials, for example, elastomers and things like that, we can say, "Hey, you know, volume um, volume is conserved." But uh, and you know, if volume is conserved, right? So if we go from here to here, if volume is conserved, then then you can basically use length 1 times cross-sectional area at 1 equals length 2 times cross-sectional area at 2 um, you know to, to predict um, contraction to predict longitudinal or uh, to predict lateral to predict lateral contraction when experiencing longitudinal strain. But this is but this is only true this but this is only true usually for elastomers. Ah. 
i.e. like very stretchy stretchy polymers um for for things like metal um we can't use this relationship here because actually you know for metals as you as you stretch them out um they're they're um they they don't may they don't maintain constant volume it turns out metals that actually you're basically applying so much force to these metals when you're stretching them out you're actually making the individual atoms you know get closer together in in certain ways and um and uh and when you do that um you know the vo the, the volume you're essentially changing the density of the material as you're as you're stretching it and that basically causes uh you know causes this relationship to not really hold so for um so for metals or, and many other materials, we need a way, you know, because we can't use this relationship, we need a way to predict. So you can imagine if I were to take, take a plot and let's say put, if I put the longitudinal strain on, uh, on one axis and I put the lateral strain on on another axis. So what do I mean by lateral strain? You know, basically you can imagine if I had some width here in state one, and I had some width here in state two, the lateral the lateral strain is equal to the width, the change in width divided by the width in the original state. And the longitudinal strain is equal to the change in length divided by the, the original length. Let's say this is L1, right? So, um, and, and these, these are, of course, I'm, I'm using the engineering definitions of these right here. So take a moment now pause and ponder, what do you think the relationship between lateral strain and longitudinal strain would be? You know, sketch, sketch what you think, what you think it looks like here. Well, it turns out that these are proportional to one another, but not quite proportional to one another in a, in a, in a linear way that looks like this. If you imagine if I have a positive, if longitudinal strain is positive, then my lateral strain is negative. Right, so when this is positive, when this is positive, this is negative. Um, basically, and, and what does that mean? Basically, if you want to increase something's length, you're almost always going to decrease its width. So usually, usually this is negative and uh, so so what you know what might it look like you know you might have a curve that looks like this so it basically goes through the origin right if I don't have any longitudinal strain I'm almost all I'm not I'm, you know it's I'm not really it's not really possible for me to have lateral stain strain in that sense and the more po the more positive I make my longitudinal strain the more negative I'm making my lateral strain right the more I'm stretching something in one direction the more it contracts in the other for most materials um, and it turns out that these two are basically linear with one another. And when they're linear with one another, you can parameterize them by, uh, you know, by, having, by having a certain slope. Oftentimes, uh, we characterize these two, uh, this, the relationship between these two with what's called the Poisson's ratio. So Poisson's ratio is oftentimes given Greek letter nu. It looks kind of like a V, but it's actually Greek letter nu. And it's defined as V uh, minus the lateral strain divided by the longitudinal strain. So basically, and this minus sign is put in here. So for most materials, uh, Poisson's ratio is positive. Um, because the sort of the, the negativeness and their relationship is incorporated uh, here rather than within the Poisson's ratio itself. And uh, I'll, I'll leave it as an exercise to the user or, or, or as an exercise to you if you want 
So, you know, you could take a moment now, pause and ponder. What is Poisson's ratio for, for an elastomer? I'll do the obnoxious professor thing and just leave it as an exercise to the user. But it turns out that if you, if you use this relationship and sort of derive an equivalent for what this curve would look like, Poisson's ratio um, ends up being 0.5. Take a moment now, pause and ponder. Let's say we had some magic material that didn't contract at all, right? You, you stretched it out and it just maintained its cross section. So what is Poisson's ratio for a magic a magic material that does not contract. Well, if you were to have such a material, you know, if it's sort of maintained here, you could imagine if I increased my longitudinal strain and longitudinal strain, if it, if it were some magic material that didn't contract as I stretched it out, then I would have no lateral strain. I would have no change in width as I, as I increased its change in length. Um, and that would be Poisson's ratio equals uh, equals zero. Uh, pause and ponder. Is it possible to have a negative Poisson's ratio? And the answer is yes but only with really weird materials. Um, and basically, the, the, those materials, did you, if, I don't know if you ever went to like the Museum of Science as a kid, and there were those like weird spheres that like were sort of made of a bunch of hinged components. And when you pulled, when you pulled the sphere apart, it, the whole thing expanded as you stretched it under one way. So. If you, ha if you could imagine linking a whole bunch of those spheres together into some weird material, if you stretched the material in one way, it would also expand in the other way. So only with weird materials that are like those weird kind of uh, hinged, you know, hinged truss-like globes that you get at the Museum of Science, only with those materials um, would you actually experience width increase when you increase its length? But for most materials, we're bounded between 0 and 0.5. And just to give you a little perspective, um, metals are usually between 0 0.17 is less than Poisson's ratio is less than uh, 0 0.33. So for most metals, you know, they're they're heartily in the middle of this uh, range here. I think steel is like 0.21 and aluminum is point um, is 0.3. So so that's that's where that's where they are. All right. So that's Poisson's ratio. Now let's talk about yield strength, the linear elastic limit, and the proportional limit. So to look at these next couple of properties, I'm going to sort of draw a really, a really big stress strain curve. And you should too. So stress and strain. So we have this big stress strain curve and we're going to label lots of features on it. So we talked about earlier for lots of materials, we get this linear region right here. And then we start deviating from linearity. Sometimes it goes up and then it kind of goes back down and breaks right here. So we're going to label lots of features right here. So this, this first feature that I would like to label is this point right here. So we have this special point, 
And the stress that corresponds to this point right here is what I'll call the yield, the yield stress. And the yield stress uh, is also, also, also called the yield strength, uh, also called the linear elastic limit and the and limit in the proportional limit. So this, the, 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 the y value of this point right here, you might call it the yield stress. You might call it the yield strength. You might call it the linear elastic limit. You might also hear it called the proportional limit. You might also hear it called the hardness. You might also hear, hear it called the hardness. All of these things essentially mean the same thing. Basically, this point here where it basic where it deviates from linearity. So, what do um, so let's let's kind of characterize what's what's exactly going on in this region for this for the set of the curve. So, let's say I have my paperclip here. Of course, this this these data would be obtained for a tensile test where I had some chunk of material and I stretched it, and then you know, you know, where I, where I was stretching it and measuring its stress and stri strain as I'm doing it, and strictly and uh, you know. For this paper clip, you know, you can imagine sort of bending it, but you know, essentially bending and stretching are, are kind of the kind of kind of the same thing. Um, they they would sort of yield equivalent conclusions. So even though I'm bending this paper clip, you can just imagine I'm stretching it in a tensile testing machine. So what's uh, so what's what's the key thing here? So for this linear elastic region, and for a paper clip here. If I take this paper clip and bend it just a little bit, bend it just a little bit, not too many, but you know, not, not, not too much, but just a little bit, and let it go, it goes back to where I was. So if I bend just a little bit, you could imagine sort of going up this curve, and then, you know, if I sort of reach this point, I reach this point right here, and I let go, you know, when I let go, it sort of follows this path back down. So if I stay be below the yield stress, if I stay below the yield stress, the material returns to its original shape. Essentially, all of the strain goes away. And if all of the strain goes away, basically the material goes back to where it was before. So if I stay below the yield stress, the material goes back to where it was before. So the material re returns to original configuration, i.e. strain goes away. And in a sense, this is no permanent deformation. So why might we care? Why might we care about the yield stress? This is sort of an open-ended question. So just sit there, you know, sit for a moment and think. Why might we care about the yield stress from an engineering perspective? Well, from an engineering perspective, permanent deformation is often disastrous right you know i don't when i'm driving my car down the road if i'm driving my car down the road and my you know uh wheel hits a pothole i don't want um you know and i apply a lot of stress to the body of the car i don't want that i don't want the body of the car to have permanent stress in it right i don't you know i don't want to be driving down the road my wheel hits a pothole and now all of a sudden one of my wheels is, is you know lopsided or cockeyed or something like that heck no right so permanent deformation is oftentimes the end of it, right? Boom, you know, we're done. Like, forget about it. Your device is ruined once you have permanent deformation set in. Um, or under some circumstances, permanent deformation might be desirable. So for example, if you're threading a catheter through someone and they have an occluded artery, you might inflate that balloon to stretch out that catheter or to stretch out a stent um, inside of someone's artery. And that stent might undergo permanent deformation. And then you might want 
that stent to remain permanently deformed inside that person's artery. You wouldn't want to just blow up the stent and then just have it return back to where it was, right? That would be the most useless stent ever. So under some circumstances, we don't want permanent deformation. And under other circumstances, we do want permanent deformation. But the most important thing is as engineers, we want to know when that's going to happen. So the yield stress is, you know, one of the most critical parameters that that governs this. It basically is saying, hey, um, you know, what happens here? So under this circumstance, right, if I have this paper clip here and I just I just give it a little bit of strain, right? I just give it enough strain, not enough to go all the way past this point here, but just a little bit, and then I let go, i.e. removing the force, I remove all of the strain. Now let's imagine a second scenario where I take this paper clip and I, you know, I encourage you to actually, you know, dig through your drawer, dig through your desk drawer, pull out some paper clips and play around with them in the same way that I am. So, so what, you know, what can you do here? You can, you know, take out a paper clip. If you take another paper clip and stretch it a bit more than I did before, so let's take this one and I'm going to try to bend it up here, let's say like 90 degrees, right? So this one I've bent, I've bent this one like 90 degrees and then I let go. If you notice, it went back part of the way, but it didn't go back all the way, right? So what happened in this second scenario, right, of this paper clip that looks like here, it looks like, that looks like this one here, well, for this second one, I'm going up, I'm going up, I'm going up. Now I brought it, for the second one, I brought it past its yield stress. So now, now I'm kind of tracing out this part. And right here, you know, this is, this is when it was bent, let's say, around 90 degrees. And then I let go. And when I let go, it didn't, unlike this one, it didn't sort of follow this curve back, but rather it sort of set out on a new curve down here. So, so you can imagine this was basically if if I if you sort of imagined if if you imagine tracing, you know this is this is when it was bent. Let's say ninety degrees, and then this is you know here it's not bent ninety degrees anymore, but it also didn't go back to where it was originally. So this is basically, um, uh, what it's how much strain you can imagine here, is essentially. You know, this is how much strain uh, was basically permanent. So this is the permanent, the permanent strain. That basically, and with that permanent strain, it's now left in this kind of goofy shape right here. So basically, you take something, you you stress it, stress it, stress it, stress it, stress it. If you take it past its yield point and then let go, it goes it goes back a little bit towards where it started off but it doesn't go all the way back to where you found it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that can, that can basically leave, leave a structure or a device or something like that um, with, with sort of permanent damage. And just to sort of characterize where, where, um, what these curves look like, it turns out that these, you know, these two curves are basically parallel. So uh, if you know what the stress strain curve is, you can basically predict, you know, even after the yield point, you know, how much, how much of that strain is going to sort of be recovered and how much of it is going to be left over permanently. Okay, so this is sort of like recovered, recovered strain. So this is the importance, the importance of the yield, the yield stress. Now, let's look at the next thing, well, the ultimate strength. So the ultimate strength, let's, let's just give, our, give ourselves a new stress strain curve here. The ultimate strength is, is kind of an artifact of the stress strain curve. So if I look at stress, strain, recall that these are typically in, uh, plotted in engineering values. The ultimate stress 
or the uh, or the ultimate strength is the very max of this one right here. So you might hear it as sigma alt, and you might call it the ultimate strength or ultimate stress. And it's basically the, the max of the curve. Now keep in mind that these are engineering values right here. So, um, so if you were to sort of plot true stress versus true strain, what you know what appears to be the ultimate stress on the on the engineering stress versus engineering strain, um, you know, might might be different, right? So recall that these are engineering values. Um, if you're plotting true value, plotting true. Let's say sigma true versus uh, versus true strain. Um, you know this max might not be apparent. And basically, you know why? Why does this actually go down? Well, this actually, you know, this basically appears to go down not necessarily because the true stress is going down but um, appears to go down because the cross-sectional area has actually decreased so much. Appears to go down mostly because, because of two, reg uh, two reasons. Reason number one is the cross-sectional area is reduced, but plot is in engineering values, and and what do I mean that by that? Well, basically, like it's, um, you know, you're stretching you're stretching something out, and its cross sectional area is increasing, even though in in truth that last little thin strand of material that you've stretched out so much is actually supporting quite a bit of stress. You're 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 dividing that force that it's that it that you're applying to it by the original area. So essentially, you're dividing you're dividing that stress by too large of an AC. So basically, you're you're sort of underestimating the amount of stress that the material actually goes. Um, so cross-sectional area is reduced, um, but but again, we're plotting engineering values. So we're sort of dividing by uh, dividing by too large of a number. And then the second region is uh, like the material itself is basically excessively damaged, right? So another reason that this that this curve might go up and go down is basically the material itself maybe has like lots of cracks going through it, or if it's a fibrous material, maybe like lots of fibers have breaked. So basically, cracks and fibers uh, breaking. And basically, once enough cracks have propagated their way through the material, or enough fibers have broken within a polymer, polymer material, you know, then there are basically so few fibers left to support the load, um, you know, that it can't that it can't support that force anymore. So you know, that's basically damage. So one one or both of these region, reasons might be why this curve actually goes down, why we sort of get an ultimate and then uh, and then it comes back down. Now let's talk about uh, fracture strength and elongation at break, at break. So fracture strength and elongation at break are both related to this point right here. So the strain um, when, when the material actually fractures is elongation at break. And it's usually expressed as a percent. Right? Usually usually people express it express it as a as a percent. So you can basically imagine, you know, if I have my Play-Doh, let's say you know I'm taking my Play-Doh, I'm stretching it out, I'm stretching it out. Okay, oh it finally broke. Well it finally broke I would say it's you know it's elongation at break 
you know, for, for this situation was, I don't know, maybe about 20% if it, if it originally started like this and then I stretched it out 20% and, you know, then put the pieces back together. Okay, it's, it's, it's broke, it broke that much. Um, so basically, it, you know, the materials testing machine basically senses once the material, you know, once it's no longer supporting any force and then it's saying, okay, how much how much did I strain the material when you know when basically the force just completely dropped off once once it fractured? Um, the and you could you could imagine that the stress that the stress associated with that is basically the fracture um, the fracture strength. the fracture stress or fracture strength. But oftentimes this, this fracture strength is, is not, not in an engineering context, not usually a very useful value because you know usually such bad things have happened before you got to this point anyway. Um, you know, usually people care about like the ultimate strength or, uh, or the yield strength um, and you know, if once basically once you're past the yield strength and definitely when you're past the ultimate strength like you, you know you're done <laughs> like you don't you don't really care about whether the material's broken or not because it's undergone such such radical deformation that it's that the device is basically useless at that point okay so let's talk about uh let's talk about two final values that we care about toughness um, and resilience. So let's draw another stress strain curve. And I'm going to break this curve into two parts. So the first part is this part, and then the second part is, let's say, a part that looks like this. Any strain that occurs in this first part, if you remember, any, any, uh, any deformation that occurs in this part is basically reversible once I let go. And this 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 part right here of the curve is what's called um, it's uh, it is or deformation that occurs within this part is elastic elastic which basically means returns to original configuration when stress is removed And this part of the curve right here is plastic deformation. So this is elastic deformation. And uh, you know, one reason why we call plastics plastics is because a lot, a lot, a lot of plastics support you know support a pretty large range of plastic deformation before they actually um before they actually break um so you know that's just why we call plastic so but plastics aren't the only things that uh, that can observe plastic deformation right this metal paper clip that i that i bent earlier um you know the strain associated with with this now being in this new shape where it was you know this that plastic deformation occurred in a metal, right? So, so when we talk about plastic deformation, we're not talking about deformation of plastics materials. We're talking about the permanent strain that we put in a material once we brought it past its yield stress. Now, um, we have so so these two these two regions, the elastic the elastic region and the plastic region, are going to be important for characterizing the last two material properties that we're going to talk about today, toughness and resilience. So, take a moment now 
pause and ponder. Which of these cups do I let my toddler drink out of? So here's a plastic cup. I think it's, it's polypropylene. And here's one that's made out of glass. So which which one do I let my which one do I let my toddler drink out of? Well, hopefully you didn't even need to pause and really ponder that long. Pause and ponder. Didn't really need to pause and ponder that long to think about it. Lennon uh, Lennon lets his toddler use the plastic cup only. I let my pot toddler use the plastic cup only. Now, um, one thing you might consider um, is, you know, what, what material properties, you know, what material properties are important, right? At least, you know, the material properties of these two cups is what is, you know, essentially what, um, you know, what I was thinking about when I let my toddler use one versus the other. So, you know, what, what are the important material properties in me deciding which cup to give to the toddler. So pause and ponder which properties were important in choosing in choosing which cup. Well, um, spoiler alert. Toughness and resilience are going to be the ones, the ones that I'm talk, the the ones that I was thinking about when in giving this, uh, when when choosing which one. So it turns out that if you look at it, um, you know, at a for a, for a naive approach, you know, a, a naive approach, you might say, hey, you know, which I I might want to choose whichever material had the largest yield strength, right? You know, if these toddlers, right, toddlers are going to be really rough on their cups that they use, they're going to abuse these cups. The toddler, you know, you might say, hey, if I'm going to give a toddler a cup, I want to give the toddler whichever cup has the higher yield strength. But, so a naive, a naive approach, which, which would basically tell us to choose whichever has higher whichever one has a higher yield stress but it actually turns out that the yield stress for glass for tempered glass like this cup is made out of is actually equal about equal to 10 times the yield strength um, for polypropylene. So the yield strength for glass is actually 10 times the yield strength for polypropylene. Yet I still choose to give my kid the polypropylene cup. So it's not yield strength that's the important thing here. It turns out that the important thing for choosing which cup to give to the toddler is not its yield strength, but rather its toughness and resilience. Now, what am I worried about with with the toddler using these cups? Well, I'm not worried about the toddler, you know, crushing it with her with her mighty fist. You know, she's not that strong. The thing that I'm worried about with her is her dropping the cup onto the hard ground. So, when I uh, when the toddler drops the cup, you can imagine the counter here and the hard floor here. When the cup gets pushed off the counter, it basically is falling down and it has some kinetic energy. It has basically some kinetic energy when it's falling and then when it hits the ground, when that cup hits the ground, basically all of that kinetic energy needs to be absorbed, needs to be absorbed in deformation in the cup. So all Ke is absorbed by the cup. So if you imagine, 
when I'm choosing whichever cup I want to give to my toddler, I'm not actually, you know, this, the yield stress is certainly one factor that I care about a little bit, but mostly what I care about is when that toddler almost inevitably drops the cup and it hits the ground, I want the cup to be really good at absorbing energy. And the yield stress is only one factor that plays into absorbing energy. So basically when that cup is, is you know, striking the ground, um, that cup not, not only needs to experience large forces, but it also needs to, um, needs to sort of absorb that force through some deformation in the cup itself. So if you remember, you know, when, when, if you dust off your, you know, high school physics or your um, intro mechanics or biomechanics notes, you'll know that energy can be sort of undone by work. And work is essentially related to force times distance. Right, so if we think of force times distance, um, basically, the gr when the cup strikes the ground, the ground is doing work on the cup in order to halt its kinetic energy. And that cup basically experiences deformation when the ground is doing work on it. And if we think about what these two axes here, the y-axis right here, stress, this is a force-like quantity. And if you remember strain, strain is essentially delta L over L. So strain is a distance like quantity. So we want the cup to not only be able to experience large forces when it, when it crashes into the ground, but also be able to withstand large displacements when it crashes into the ground too, because both force and distance are necessary to essentially do work on the cup to absorb all of the kinetic energy that it built up during its fall. So we need both force and distance to do that. And in a sense, what do we need? We need this point here. We need this point here to essentially be as far to the right as possible to get a lot of distance and as high vertically as possible to essentially um, to essentially absorb to essentially have a high have a high force and if we're actually being a little bit more precise in our sort of force times distance well um, the the, uh, the you know the th the thing that we care about is, it's, you know, it's not exactly really force times distance here, but rather the area under the curve up to this point right here. So the area, the area under the curve is basically related to the energy that it can absorb and if we're considering the, the, the point up to here, you know, up, up to the yield stress, the area, the area under the curve is the energy that it can absorb up to yield stress. You know, this, this area is sort of the energy that it can absorb up, up, to, up to yield stress. So this pink area right here has a special name, um, and it's called the resilience. So the resilience is the area under the curve. And it's related to the energy that it can absorb um, up to the yield stress. So take a moment now, pause and ponder. What are the units of resilience? Well, hopefully you've had a chance to pause and ponder. Um, if you were to sort of do this, um, the, you know, you could essentially imagine it as the area of this triangle, right? So, you know, for this, um, it would essentially be one half this times this. 
and strain is dimensionless and stress has units and stress has, has units of um, you know pascals or newtons per square meter so basically you know one half times something dimensionless times something with units of stress so it basically has units of pascals which you could say is a newton per square meter or equivalently you could say it's a newton meter per cubic meter or a joule per cubic meter so in a sense, resilience is not is not not just the energy that it can absorb um, up to its yield stress, but it's sort of like the energy per unit volume. So for example, if I'm designing a bumper for a car, or a helmet for a bike wearer, or a cup for a toddler to use, resilience is a very important um, an important factor there because if I want this thing to be able to absorb energy in some kind of impact you know um, I can I can do so by having a material that has a high resilience you know or alternatively I can do it by having a large volume of material just you know by sheer volume the material can just absorb a lot of impact uh, absorb a lot of energy you know. so the final thing that I want to discuss here is not just the area under this curve up to the yield stress right here, but what would be under some applications, I might care not, not, a, not just about the part of this area under the curve up to the yield stress, but the area under the whole curve. So the final thing we're talking about right here is the area under the whole curve. The area under the whole curve is what we call toughness. And this also has units of joules per meter cubed, right? It, we're just, you know, instead of integrating just up to here, we're integrating the whole thing. Um, and so, so toughness. Now, under some applications, you might want a material with high resilience. And under some material, uh, some applications, you want a material uh, with high toughness. So toughness is good for sort of a single a single use impact and res and resilience is basically good for repeated impacts so what you know when might we care about toughness you know when might we, when might we have a single use impact well a bicycle helmet right You know, if I if I fall off my bike and smash my bike helmet, um, you know, I'm not I'm not going to have like I'm I'm not going to use that bike helmet again, right? Once I smash my bike helmet, you know, I'm like thanks for saving my head, bike helmet, but um, you know, your your services are complete. I'm going to go out and buy a new bicycle helmet, right? So if something just needs to survive one impact, you know, one impact without fracturing. Right, one impact without fracturing and exposing my head to the concrete underneath, um, like a bike helmet. You know, that's what I want to use here. But you know, I want a material to have high resilience when it's going to experience repeat impacts. Right. So, so an example here, you know, example of when when something is going to experience re repeated impacts are um, are, for example, like the sh uh, the shocks in my car right i want my car to be drive able to drive over more than one pothole so basically you know i want those shocks to absorb the impact and then be able to return to their state once i've you know once i've driven down the road for just just a moment afterwards right if if i had shock absorbers that you know could only absorb one impact but then were sort of permanently deformed after that you know forget about it so the shocks in my car you know they need to be able to absorb a lot of energy Right, those springs in the suspension under my car, they need to be able to absorb a lot of energy without permanently deforming if they're going to be able to, to, uh, to sort of take those impacts again and again and again and again. Whereas a bicycle helmet, you know, once I smash my head on that bicycle helmet, and in fact, you know, if you look at the manufacturer instructions on your bicycle helmet, it says, you know, if you're ever in a crash with your bike helmet, 
don't ever use it again. Throw that bike helmet away and get a new one. And, and a lot of times, even if you haven't, even even if you don't visibly see any cracks um, in that bike helmet, you know, if you if you smash your bike helmet, like, you know, it's worth the the forty bucks or whatever to go out and buy go out and buy a new helmet. Save your head because that bicycle helmet might have experienced permanent deformation and it might not be quite as tough as it is as it was the second time around. So. Thus concludes our discussion of material properties in the context of stress-strain curves. We, you know, we cared, we, we talked about all of these properties here. So, um, and I hope you found this lecture helpful, and good luck with your study of biomaterials. Thank you.